to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Well, in 10 days, Catherine and the kiddos and I are going to drive to Atlanta, Georgia to visit my mom for the Thanksgiving break. And no sooner will we pull onto the interstate, will one of our children ask the most famous words in all of parenthood, when will we be there, right? How much longer? And though it's not a question, it's an alt-repeated statement, this is taking forever, right? At least in our car that happens, perhaps it doesn't happen in y'all's, but it happens in ours. And that question will be asked numerous times until we pull into my mother's driveway, put the car in park, pull up the parking brake, get out, walk in. That's when it will cease. They always want to know when we're going to get there, how much longer. It's the same question that I asked my parents every time we drove I-75 south down to Cordial to visit my grandparents. Their home was two and a half hours away, but as a child, it felt like it took forever. So I would persistently ask, how much longer, how much longer, when will we be there? Over and over and over again, but my dad was smart, and he knew that if he gave me a sign or a marker, that perhaps, just perhaps, I might not ask that question again for the duration of the trip. And it worked. Because on I-75, if you're familiar with it, exit 101, there is the most curiously placed, decommissioned Titan missile standing there on the side of 75. And as a kid, I knew that as soon as we got there, that we were 10 minutes away from my grandparents' house. That was the sign I needed. It was recognizable. And now, whenever we drive I-75 south, the kids know as soon as we're uh, getting closer to the Georgia-Florida Parkway, they know to look for the rocket. It's a tradition I passed down. Because we all like signs, right? We all need signs. I do. They can be helpful, and they can help us know where we are and how much longer we have till we're done. And that's what the disciples were asking for this morning. That's why they were asking Jesus to give them a sign. Now, the story takes place in the temple, and at this time, it was being rebuilt by Herod the Great. It was being expanded, and the temple was massive, covered 35 acres. It took 20,000 people simply to operate it day in and day out, and it was an impressive structure, 40-foot-tall marble columns, gold plates along the side of the temple itself, so when the sun shined, it would reflect the sun's glory. It was meant to impress, and it did. So if you can imagine the disciples, country come to city, standing in the temple saying, wow, this is beautiful. Never seen anything like it. To which Jesus says this, all of this that you're really impressed with is coming down every stone. In fact, it's going to come down so hard that not a single stone will be laid upon another when it's finished. I can imagine that the disciples might have scratched their head, and they wanted to know when this would happen, because it was massive, it was huge, and it was going to take a whole lot of work to bring it down, so they wanted to know, when will that be? When can we see this happen? But in summary... Jesus doesn't really ask, answer their question about when it's going to come down, but instead, he talks with them about how they're to live until it does. He doesn't tell them necessarily when it will come down. He, he tells them some frightening things about plagues and pestilence, famine, wars and kingdoms warring against each other, nations warring against each other, but he never gives a specific time. Because he's more concerned with how they will live in the meantime. 
He's more concerned with whether or not they will be able to not be afraid, whether they'll be able to tell their story, and whether they'll be able to trust him in the end. Jesus is most concerned with how they're going to live in the meantime. And he says, do not be afraid. He speaks to this fear in this morning's gospel lesson. He says, don't be afraid, because he knows that when we're frightened, we do one of two things. We either run away and hide. We kind of bunker down, right? Or we begin to chase after safety and comfort in really unhealthy ways, believing that we can actually keep ourselves away from our fear. Therefore, just safe enough and comfortable enough that things won't be so frightening. Oftentimes, though, we do them both, right? We run and hide like a frightful child. We chase after safety and comfort. Have you read about the $300 million luxury community that's being developed northeast of Dallas, Texas? It's supposed to be a one-of-a-kind community when it's completed. Because each home there, are you ready for this? Each home there will be equipped with airlock blast doors and off-grid energy and water production. This $300 million community that's being developed is a luxury community for doomsday preppers. I'm not joking. The developers were interviewed in the newspaper and they said, we're building a community that will last two centuries or longer. And it won't just be a hole in the ground to hide in. It's going to be one of the most plush resorts in all of Texas, if not America. People are getting fearful of this world. There's ISIS, and there are things like the Zika virus and other scary things that they see on TV. People are nervous. People want a place that they can have safety for themselves and for the future of their families, and if need be, this is bold. It's going to be one of the safest places in all time. Wow. (laughs) That's hubris. And it's contrary to what Jesus is teaching this morning. You might have heard Father Andrew say this before. It's one of my favorite things he says because I need to hear it sometimes. He says, fear is not a fruit of the Spirit. Of all the fruits of the Spirit, fear isn't one of them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, fear, and self-control, right? (laughs) No. It's not a fruit of the Spirit, Because as Christians, we're called not to be afraid. We're not not called to be fearful. And in the world, there are models, there are examples of this. We can see when Christians have chosen not to be fearful, when they've chosen not to be afraid, and they've chosen to live confidently in God's grace. I was reading recently about the saffron surge in India. It's being conducted by a political movement called the Hindutva. And this movement is a Hindu movement, political movement, and oftentimes, it's not seen in the press, but they can be just as violent as ISIS or any other radical Islamic group. And you know what's happening in India among the Christians there? The church is growing. It's thriving. There are churches of tens of thousands of people every Sunday, 10 services a day, 7,000 children in Sunday school. The church in India is growing because they aren't hiding, and they're not chasing after comfort and safety. One Indian pastor said this. He said that the oppression is so bad, especially in the northern parts of India, that the pastors have the saying, where two or more are gathered, The policeman is there long before Jesus. They're waiting to pounce on him. They're waiting for them to meet so they can take him away. But still they meet. Still they grow. When asked about this, 
by an American pastor who said, you know, we're praying for you that your persecution will cease, that it will come to an end. And this Indian pastor said this. He said, please, do not pray that the persecution will stop. Pray that we will be sustained during the persecution. Wow. No comfort, no safety, no hiding. Instead of asking God to take it all away, they're asking him, give me the grace to be sustained through this. Give me the grace. And what's happened is they've told their story. Indian Christians there are sharing the gospel with Hindus, Muslims, with neighbors, with colleagues, and the gospel is going forth boldly. Whenever we hide, whenever we run away, whenever we kind of chase after comfort and safety, we become so preoccupied that we can no longer see the purpose for which we were created and the purpose for which we were saved, which is to tell our story. That's the reason we've been redeemed. That's the reason we've been rescued. And all of us have stories to tell. Whether it's a story of of a once young child who walked the aisle of a, of a Methodist church, gave his life to Jesus. Or it may be someone who was in the throes of addiction, that Jesus came in and rescued them. Or maybe it's someone who chose to give up everything and go somewhere where the gospel had not yet been proclaimed. Or maybe it's that someone whose daily work is getting hammered but still they choose to trust the Lord. All of us have a story to tell, and we have the privilege of inviting others to join us in this story for the purpose of telling others. We all have stories of amazing grace. John Eldridge is a favorite author of mine. And he was describing his childhood in the most idyllic ways in a book I was reading. And he said when he was a child, about 10 or 11, he was sent every summer to his grandfather's ranch in eastern Oregon. And his grandfather let him have the most fun. John Eldridge says at the time he didn't realize that he was actually working. <laughs> but he was having so much fun. They were mending fences and rounding up cattle. And in the evenings he would take a uh, rifle and shoot cans. I mean, like boyhood dream, right? But he said of all the experiences he had, two of the most meaningful were driving with his grandfather through town where everyone in that community knew him and they would wave to him. And he would wave back. People would smile and and Eldridge says that sitting in the cab of that truck, he knew that he was loved. And he was proud to be loved by his grandfather because his grandfather was a good man who was respected. And his grandfather had passed down to him the story of his own life by inviting him in to his own Second favorite memory he said he had was on Sunday afternoons and they'd go pop calling. You know what pop calling is? It's where you pop in and call on people, unannounced. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how often that happens these days with texting and everything else, but once upon a time, we'd go pop calling. And you mainly go visit your relatives after church and after lunch on Sundays. And mysteriously, somehow, every Sunday, there was always a freshly baked pie ready for everyone. And there were chairs gathered in a circle because it was a ritual. And Eldridge says that they would go pop call him and they'd pull into a driveway, they'd walk into the home and there would be the, the chairs in a circle and there would be rhubarb pie and they'd sit down and they'd talk and he would hear all these stories shared among relatives. And he said, one day, he was asked by one of the relatives, so tell me about your week. And he said that he beamed with pride, and he said, let me tell you about my week. And he did. 
Because he was invited into the story, he felt like he was part of something. And because he was part of something, he's now grown. And he has children of his own, and he's now sharing with them how to invite others into their lives so that they may know Christ, so that they may tell others. Telling our story can be frightening, especially in these days. But Jesus tells his disciples there in the shadows of the temple to trust him. He says, trust me, and take every opportunity you have in this meantime to share your story, but don't prepare yourself, because if you prepare yourself, you're going to miss out on everything that's happening in the meantime. And if you miss out on everything that's happening in the meantime and living faithfully for me, sharing your story, you won't have a story to tell. Trust me. It's a beautiful expression. He says, when the time comes, when you're telling your story, I will give you a mouth and a mind. I will give you a mouth and a mind, both of which are developed in the daily living out of our lives, faithfully sharing with others what's been shared with us. It's so easy to be preoccupied with preparing ourselves. Living faithfully in the meantime is our preparation, though. Many of you know the story of Corey Timboom and her sister Betsy. You know that Corey emerged safely, uh, relatively unharmed, from a Nazi concentration camp. But her father and her sister did not. They died. And Corey tells the story of her dying sister's final words who having experienced unbelievable hardship, unbelievable persecution because of their Christian faith, she said, Betsy, my sister, said as she was dying, Corey, don't cry for me because there is no pit so deep that our Lord is not deeper still. There is no pit so deep that our Lord is not deeper still. He's present. He's with me. And I trust him. What does it mean to live in the meantime? To not be afraid? To tell our story and to trust the Lord? It means that we have the opportunity and the privilege to live with peace and with purpose. Always remembering the words of our Lord. Do not be afraid. Continue telling your story. And trust me. Amen.